Well, y'all, I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled to say I'm stoked about this morning. I just have to say, I love being your pastor. This is the greatest church ever. The great, greatest group of people ever. And uh, I, I've honestly, in the 33 years that I've been alive, I've never been happier than I am right now. And, uh, and it's because of you guys. When you show up and when you allow God to move in your lives and you grow, it does something to me. And I thank you because you guys are awesome. We all am excited um, about the, um, the message. How many senior citizens do we have in here? We have a great group of senior citizens. All right, you guys can put, put your hand down. Now, how many people, maybe you're not senior citizens, you would qualify for that, but how many people have been going to church for at least 30, 35 years? Okay, so how many of you guys remember when church was much different than it is now? <laughs> much different, huh? So some of the changes that have been made have been great changes. Other changes that have been made, eh, not so good. <laughs> I knew I was going to get some of that. The changes that we've been making lately have great changes. Yes. <laughs> and so listen, what you know, when you, if you've been in church for a long time, it's very, very different than it used to be. For example, used to when you would come into church, there wasn't these wonderful, cushy, soft chairs to sit in, were there? I can, I can remember uh, sitting on a pew bench that the back of it was, you know, giving me a crick in my back. You could go to sleep all right on it if you laid down because you got the cushion. But I, I can't remember being, I have in Mexico, I've been in these churches, but there's churches that still are sitting on wood benches. And used to, everyone sat on a wood bench in a church. Y'all remember those times? And how about the times before there was gigantic congregations of people and you had like a smaller community church? Y'all remember that? The community church. Clawson used to be a smaller community church. What about the times before the wonderful bands? It was rough. It was rough. <laughs> Listen, did y'all know that back in the day, white people actually had rhythm? <laughs> See, you're not required to clap in church anymore. So used to, when you were in church, you were the band. And everybody clapped. And everyone was on rhythm. I can remember growing up, everybody's clapping and everybody's on rhythm. Nowadays, my OCD kills me when we start clapping. We start clapping and ain't nobody around me on rhythm. <laughs> you got one person that's on beat and then you got... And then, I mean, it is, listen, used to, everyone made up the band. How many of y'all remember those days? <laughs> How about this one? The days before projectors and cool lighting. Listen, I don't know about you. Maybe it's a young millennial type thing, but I love to be able to dim down the lights and just be in the presence of the Lord. Kind of like a candlelight dinner with my wife, having a candlelight and atmosphere and environment with God. I love that. I think it's wonderful. I, I love that change that was made. How many of y'all remember back when the youth didn't sit in their own section? And what happened was, and the kids was also in the church too, and what happened was, Oof, this was a good, good old times. You sat about two or three rows in front of your parents with your friends. And then when you started cutting up in church, here's what happened. You heard this. And when you heard that snap, all three of you, you're looking over at your friends and you're like, oh, snap, whose dad is it? <laughs> On three, let's turn around. One, two, three. Everybody turns around. Dang it, it's my dad. And so you're sitting there like contemplating, what do I need to do? What do I need to, I got it. I'm going to go to the altar and confess my <laughs> sins this morning. Because if I go to the altar and confess my sins, he might have mercy. Anybody else remember those times? <laughs> Three of y'all, praise God. Amen. Listen, about, what about the times, but this was way back in the day, but used to, now you have all kind of different preaching styles. So you have like, um, uh, you have topical preaching, which is mostly what I do. I like to find topics that I feel like the Lord is, is, is challenging me with and challenging our church with, like making a difference and preach on those topics. And then you have, um, then you have I think it's called expository preaching or something like that, where you, you take and you open up the word. And this is how they used to do it. There didn't used to be a whole lot of topical preaching. It was the pastor would get up and he would open up his Bible and he would use the word and just go through the word and he would take his points out of the word. How many of y'all remember those times? I knew we'd have a lot of seniors. That There's still a lot of pastors that do some really, really great 
that kind of teaching, that kind of preaching. I'm not typically one of those because of uh, OCD and some of the things that I have of trying to get in and I got to write down everything because I don't have a filter and if I just have my Bible, you're going to hear some things that are crazy. <laughs> That's just me being honest. <laughs> But listen, listen, for this month, me and Jordan, we were talking, we've been, we were praying at the beginning of the year, we were talking about what we want to do in 2020 and where we felt like God was challenging us with. And we were like, hey, why don't we kick it old school for a month? And why don't we grab the Bible? Here's what, here's what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter four and verse 12. Here's what it says. You ready? It says, the word of God is alive yeah. and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Listen, this is not just a book of stories. This is God's words put into a book for us so that we could grow, so that we can move forward. It is a live cutting between joint and marrow. Everybody say that's power. And so for this month, what we've decided what we are going to do, not anything against topical preaching. I love topical preaching and God has been moving and moving and moving in the things that we've been preaching and seeing done, all the challenges that I feel like God has been giving you guys. But for this month, we're going to kick it old school. We're going to go back and we're going to take the life of one person in the Bible. And for the next four weeks, we're going to dig into that person's life. And so we're going to dig into the life of, of a man by the name of Solomon. How many of y'all know who Solomon is? Several of you do not know who Solomon is, and that is great. That's why I want to dig into the life of Solomon. Listen, King Solomon, as we read about Solomon in the Word, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about life lessons from Solomon. So the, the whole month, the rest of this month, maybe one month into, I mean, one week into March, we're going to dig in life lessons from King Solomon. Some of you may have heard King Solomon was known as the wisest man to ever live. How cool is that? I would say there's probably some pretty good lessons that we can learn from the wisest man that ever lived. Okay, so as we get started this morning, I have this video that I want to share. Go ahead, Andrew. In the story of the Bible, King Solomon was the wisest ruler that Israel ever had. And there are three books in the Hebrew Scriptures connected to him. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs. They pass down the legacy of Solomon's wisdom, but in a surprising way. So let's talk about how to read the books of Solomon. Okay, to really appreciate the story of Solomon's wisdom, we have to go back to the Garden of Eden. Where God created humanity, male and female. Right, Adam and Eve. And God commissions them to rule the world together in intimacy and love. Kings and queens of creation. Now, in order to rule, you need to be wise. And the humans have a choice about how to gain wisdom. Yeah, they could live by God's wisdom, which will lead to life or they could become wise in their own eyes. And that's what they choose, to take the knowledge of good and bad into their own hands. And immediately, the intimacy between man and woman is broken. They hide their bodies from each other and then from God. Their choice leads to division and death. But the story holds out hope for a future human who will make the right choice and rely on God's wisdom. Like King Solomon, he prayed that God would give him the knowledge to know good from bad so he could rule with true wisdom. Exactly. He reverses the failure of Adam and Eve, and it leads to abundance. In Solomon's day, every Israelite sat in peace under their own fruit tree. Oh, it's like he's creating Eden. Well, for a while. But then Solomon fails. He marries hundreds of women from other nations, and he's deceived to follow their gods. And this begins Israel's long descent into self-destruction. And so when we turn to the books of Solomon, we're invited to learn wisdom from his successes and his failures. Got it. Heavenly Father, we love you, God. Lord, we pray as we dive into the books of Solomon, as we dive into his life, that you would help us to make it apply to our lives today. Help us to see lessons that we can learn and we can implement in ourselves. And Lord, I love you and thank you and praise you in your precious name I pray, amen. amen. All right, y'all, I'm ready, I'm excited. Here we go, if you're taking notes, the title to the message is Accepting Your Role. Accepting Your Role. Solomon was a mighty king over Israel, but before any of that had 
happened, before any of that took place, he had to accept this role as king. And there was a whole lot that took place before he ever became king. So we're gonna dig into the backstory of Solomon before he becomes king. So if, 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 how many of you know and have heard of David and Bathsheba? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm not going to read all of the story of David and Bathsheba, but we are going to dig into some of it. Some of you think that you have a complicated relationship. Listen, the, the relationship that we're about to go through is way more complicated than anything that you've ever dealt with. So let me tell you, let me share with you as you're turning uh, the story of David and Bathsheba. So David, King David, ever said King David? David. King David should have been out fighting war and he was not. Instead, he was at home looking at his kingdom. Should have been out fighting for his kingdom. He's at home looking at his kingdom. So he's on top of his palace, and he's looking out, and he sees this beautiful woman, and her name is? Her name is Bathsheba. So she's out on top of her roof, naked, bathing. Very bad for King David. Should have been out at war. He's looking at this woman, and he decides, I'm going to get to know a little information about her. So he begins to inquire about Bathsheba. And what does he learn? He learns that she's married. She's married to one of the men that are fighting for his kingdom right now. So that should mean off limits. I should have got at least one amen on that. Married means off limits. So what happens is David calls for her. She comes to his bedroom. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant by David, and he sends her home so that she can go back to her husband. Well, in the midst of all this, her husband's name is Uriah, and he's trying to think of how can I fix this situation? I've slept with this woman. I've committed adultery. I've I've, I've done all these things. How can I fix this situation? So he sends for Uriah to come home. And he thinks to himself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to get him. He's going to come home. I'm going to get him to sleep with his wife. Then he's going to go back and she's going to have this baby while he's gone. And he's going to be like, hey, that's my kid. So he brings Uriah home. He calls for Uriah to come home. Uriah comes home. And David says, why don't you go home and wine and dine your wife? That's actually what it says in my Bible. I thought that was very cool. Wine and dine your wife. And Uriah says, no, sir. I'm not going to whine and dine my wife. My men that I'm fighting with and fighting for are out fighting, and I will not come home and whine and dine my wife until they get to come home and whine and dine their wives. That's the kind of guy we're talking about here. So David's like, oh, snap, I'm in trouble. So he begins to think, well, why don't you just hang out at my house? Because the first night, he sleeps outside of the gates until David will send him back. So then David brings him into his house and he says, why didn't you go and wind and dine your wife? And he says, because I want to go back out and fight with my men. I want to do that when they can do that. And so David says, well, hey, why don't you stay and have supper with me? David gets him drunk and he tries to convince him to go and sleep with his wife and he goes back outside the gates. That's the kind of guy we're dealing with. So then David sends Uriah back fighting and has his men pull back and allow him to get killed. You have adultery, you have cheating, you have lying, and now you have murder that gets David and Bathsheba together. So when Uriah gets killed, David brings Bathsheba into the palace and she becomes his wife. And God is so irritated with this this relationship that he sends an illness on this baby and this baby dies. Okay, now we're going to jump into the story right there. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 24 and 25. So this is right after the baby dies. It says, then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and he slept with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And David named him Solomon. Now listen to this next part. The Lord loved the child and sent word through Nathan the prophet that they should name him Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord as the Lord had commanded. So let's stop right here. As we're jumping into the life of Solomon, before he's ever born, as he is born, we see, number one, lesson number one, despite your background, God has a role for you. Despite your background, God has a role for you. Solomon was born from a very shameful situation. This whole incident was was shameful. It was a very low point in David's life. And from that low point came the birth of this man, Solomon. Listen, church, that that is good news for us. 
Why is that good news for us? Here's why. Because just like Solomon, just like Solomon's family, just like his parents, probably most of us in this room have a background that's just not the best background. And what we need to understand is it doesn't matter what has been in our background, God still has a clear cut purpose for my life. He has a specific role for me to play. He has his eyes on me no matter where I've come from, no matter what I've done, no matter who my parents are, no matter what they've done. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is that I am his child. And because I am his child, he has a role for me to play. Mm. You know, you know, one of the things that makes this so significant is that in the Old Testament, when you read, you read a lot about generational curses. In the Mosaic law, when, when somebody does something foolish, then what happens is not only that person, but then several generations. They stoned whole families. They burned whole families. They kicked whole families out of Israel. It wasn't just the person that made the mistake. And so when we look at the life of Solomon and we looked at him being birthed, some of the things that we could think is, Ooh, there ain't no way God's blessing that baby. Why? Do you know what his daddy did? Do you, did you know that King David was sleeping with Bathsheba and then he had her, her husband murdered? Did you know? Did, there ain't no way that he's blessing that baby. Solomon is not going to be the man that's blessed. He's going to have to find one of David's other kids to bless if he wants one of them to be the king. So when you look at this Baby Solomon, what you think is this kid's a product of horrible sin. In order for him to be birthed, there was lies, adultery, thievery, murder that took place. And because of those sins, there's no way that God's, because of that background, there's no way that God's going to bless him. And then here's what the scripture says. I love this. The Lord loved the child and even gave him the name, beloved of the Lord. Listen, it didn't matter his background. Clawson, you need to understand it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter how long you have been on drugs. It doesn't matter how long you, how many people you have slept with. It doesn't matter. It does, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is you taking the, 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 you taking the step to becoming an heir of God. And when you become an heir of God, you become a child of God. And when you become a child of God, then all things are wiped away. The Bible talks about us having a new birth in him. Listen, when I receive that new birth, even though Satan wants me to think about all of the things that I did before I was giving my life to the Lord, even though he wants me to think about the drugs that I used to do and the fact that I think that I'm, I'm, I can never be good in God's kingdom and he will never want to use me, Satan wants to bring those things. But if we step on, if we stand on the word of God, the word of God teaches us that it doesn't matter what happened before we were saved. The only thing that matters is what you do now. Amen. 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 Listen, if you're in here and you're breathing, God has a role for you to play. Well, Pastor, Pastor, I'm 75 years old, and I've been playing that role for a long time. And I'm tired. Listen, I want to encourage you. Don't you dare let Satan try to tell you that you're worthless or you're too old or you can't do anything for the kingdom. Let me tell you something. Some of the people that make the spirituality in here so powerful is our seniors and the way that they pray for our church. And maybe at this stage in your life, your role is to, is to battle the darkness in prayer. Maybe that this stage in your life, your role is to, is to take some of the young people that are coming up and help them to move forward and teach them what is right. But here's what I want to tell you. If you have breath in your lungs, God is not done with you. He has a purpose for you and he has a role for you. Well, pastor, you just don't know. You don't know what I've done. I've, I've, I've done so many bad things. There's no way that God could possibly want me in his kingdom or want to use me because everybody in this community knows who I was and they know my background. There's no way anybody would ever trust me. Listen, that's Satan. That's not God. And God is saying, I want to use you and I have a role for you. But pastor, I don't have any talents whatsoever. Yes, you do. You have talents, and God wants to use those talents. Amen. 
God has a role for you. Somebody shout amen. Amen. So now we're going to dig into the word. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 1. God has a role for who? For you. Some people said you. Some people said me. Everybody say me. Uh Uh-huh. Don't put it off on somebody else. It's you. (laughs) So we're going to 1 Kings chapter 1. We're going to do a major fast forward now in the life of Solomon. So there's not just a whole lot that we see on his childhood, on his teen years. So now Solomon is a man. We know that David has promised Bathsheba, Solomon's mom, that he's going to be the king. And so as we get into 1 Kings, what we see is David is about to die. And one of his sons decides, I'm just going to appoint myself as the king. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 1, we're going to start reading verses 5 through 10. And I told you we're going to dig into the scripture, so I'm going to read quite a bit. Here we go. It's 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. It says, about that time, David's son, Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, began boasting, I will make myself king. He provided himself with chariots and charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. Now his father was King David. Now listen to this. This is a good life lesson right here. His father, was, his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, even by asking, why are you doing that? Write down in your notes, my kids need discipline. Okay? Adonijah had been born after Absalom, and he was very handsome, especially the handsome ones. <laughs> they need discipline. <clears throat> And then in verse 7, it says, Adonijah took Jaab, I'm sorry, Joab, son of uh, Zeruiah, and Abathar, the priest, into his confidence, and they agreed to help him become the king. But Zadok, the priest, Benaiah, and Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Rei, and David's personal bodyguard refused to support Adonijah. Verse 9, Adonijah went to the stone of Zohileth near the spring of Enragel, where he sacrificed sheep, cattle, and fatted calves. He invited all of his brothers and his other, all of his brothers, the other sons of the king of David, sons of King David, and the royal officials of Judah, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the king's bodyguard, or his brother Solomon. Okay, let's stop right here. So, God has a role for who? Me. For you. Satan always wants to stop that role from taking place. Always. So what does he do? He puts things up to try to make you back down, try to make you doubt, or try to make you think that this role is not for you. So what happens? Here is what happens. What happens is, as he is getting, or David is getting old, Solomon is preparing to become the king. Bathsheba has probably been talking about this since he was a little bitty boy. One day you're going to be the king. You need to prepare yourself. You need to da, 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 da. Now what's happened is one of his brothers has went and made himself king. How many mamas do we have in here? How many mamas, when something happens to your child, you go crazy mama bear on people? I've seen y'all do it. I've seen my wife do it. I've had to hold her back three or four times. That's no joke. Like, babe, you are supposed to be a Jesus freak. What are you doing? So what happens? What? Hey, we're all we're all human, y'all. Amen. So what happens? Here's what happens. Bathsheba decides, oh, no, sir, Adonijah is not going to be the king. So she goes into David's room. We're turning turn to verse 16, same chapter, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 16. It says she goes into his room. Verse 16 says, Bathsheba bowed down before the king. What can I do for you? He asked her. She replied, my Lord, you made a vow before the Lord. Isn't that, isn't that how women do it? You told God. You made a vow before the Lord, when your God, when you said to me, your son Solomon will surely be the next king and will sit on my throne. But instead, Adonijah has made himself the king, and my Lord the king does not even know about it. He has sacrificed many cattle, fatted calves, and sheep. He's invited all the king's sons to attend the celebration. He invited Excuse me, Abathar the priest and Joab the commander of the army, but he did not invite your servant Solomon. And now, my Lord, the king, all Israel is waiting for you to announce who will become king after you do. If you do not act, my son Solomon and I will be treated as criminals. And soon, my Lord, as soon as my Lord, the king has died. That's a lot. Woman, I'm dying. (laughs) Could you leave me alone? (laughs) 
She comes in and she gives this big spill and then Nathan the prophet comes in right after her. She goes out of the room and Nathan the prophet begins to confirm everything that Bathsheba just told him. And then we jump down to verse 28 and it says, King David responded, call Bathsheba. She came back in and stood before the king and the king repeated his vow as surely as the Lord lives who has rescued me from every danger, your son Solomon will be the next king and will sit on my throne this very day, just as I vowed to you before the Lord, the God of Israel. Here's what I want you to understand. First of all, you need to know that it doesn't matter your background. God has a role for you. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. God has a role for you to play. And that role is to assist in the building of his kingdom. Somebody say amen. Amen. Secondly, number two, second lesson is never doubt the role that God has you in. Never doubt the role that God has you in. Anybody ever dealt with that? There's a lot of liars in here this morning. <laughs> Listen, I can relate. It almost feels hypocritical preaching this point. From the moment that I became a pastor... That ain't easy, y'all. There's a lot of stress with that. I became a pastor in 2006, and I started being a youth pastor. And I remember my past coming and hitting me so many times. <laughs> you think you're worth it? You, I, rem- I remember seeing you smoke weed here. I remember. Da, 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 da. And every single time Satan threw my past at me, I would go home. And I'd be like, God, I'm not worthy. (laughs) I can't be a pastor. What are you talking about? I can't do this. Going on. And, and, you know, then I was a Christian for about five years. And our youth ministry was blowing up. And it was doing well. And then you have all these jealous youth pastors that are mad because their youth ministry isn't running 200 and something kids. And at Clawson, we're busting 200 kids. And I remember sitting in meetings with youth pastors and hearing people say under their breath, The only reason he's doing anything is because he's under his dad. Youth pastors just tearing me down. And when they would do that, I would go home and I would question, is that really the only reason that I, are you doing this? Is dad doing this? Am I, you know? And so I would, I remember, I remember having doubt just rip me to pieces. And that doubt wound up me leaving because I wanted to see if I could be a youth pastor somewhere else. And so I left. And I mean, on and on, I have faced doubt and faced doubt. As a matter of fact, the biggest doubt I've ever faced in my life was becoming your pastor. God, that was so hard. That was the toughest. I told you the truth a while ago. I'm the happiest that I've ever been, but I was the worst I've ever been about four years ago. So much doubt. I remember hearing people in the community talking about my father and lies being spread about the way that we were transitioning in this church and all of this junk going. And I'm going home crying every night and probably the lowest part ever. It was a board meeting that my dad had came out of and he walked, he came over to my house and he said, Josh, true story. He said, I think that you need to start looking for a job. And I put my head down. I was like, are you kidding me? Look, after all this, we've been going at this for like 18 months. And he said, I don't think that they want you to be the pastor. And I went and I couldn't sleep. And I mean, I I just prayed and prayed, God, could you please open a door somewhere else? Because I can't do this anymore. Could you just have somebody call me? I'll leave. I'm okay with that. And he didn't open the door. And because he didn't open the door, I said, if you don't open the door, I'm going to stay and I'm going to fight. And y'all, we wouldn't be here today if I let doubt stop me from doing what I knew that God had called me to do. And the reason I share that is because there's people in here that you do that. You allow doubt comes to all of us. But do not allow that doubt to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let's go back to Solomon. 
the Bible doesn't give us a lot of insight on what's going on in Solomon's mind. But I can imagine right now it's not pretty. Should I kill my brother? Because that's kind of how they did things back then. Like, Lord, you want me to go take him out? I mean, I can. Uh, you know, should, should I, what, what should I do? And Solomon, you, we don't hear almost anything about Solomon. I, I don't know if he's like not this massive aggressive person like David was. You don't see him going and starting all these wars all the time. Uh, but um, so I, I can't imagine what's going on in his mind. But I'm sure his brother's just taking the, the throne. I'm sure there's doubt. I'm sure he's angry. I'm sure he's like, Lord, I, I don't understand what's going on. What do you want me to do? You want me to back down? Because I will. What do you want me to do? And so all this is going on in his mind, but the Lord had him right where he needed to be at the right time, and he promoted him in the right way. So let's read the final portion of scripture for today, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, in the story. I got some more scriptures for you, but in the story. It says, as the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I'm going where everyone on earth must go someday. Take courage and be a man. <laughs> I say that to my kids sometimes. Just, you know, you just want to tell your kids, be a man. You know, anybody else? No? Okay. Praise God. <laughs> Observe the requirements of the Lord your God. Now listen, this is important, y'all. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, the commands, the regulations, the laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all that you do and wherever you go. I love verse four. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise that he made to me. He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me, with faith, and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. And then in the following verses, David does something crazy. So in the following verses, he pretty much gives him a list of things that he needs to do. And the list goes something like this. Okay, I'm about to die. When I die, first thing you need to do is you need, you need to treat these people pretty good. Because they've you need to remember them because of what they did for us when we were moving across and blah, 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 blah. And then this guy, you need to kill him. Just take him out. Oh, you, I, you, you show, oh, hey, show mercy to this guy. That guy, you need to take him out. He's gone. Matter of fact, kill him too uh, because he's, he's going to cause you a lot of trouble and a lot of pain. So David goes through this whole thing like, this is what you need to do, and then he dies. <laughs> Fun, right? So now Solomon is like, can you imagine being Solomon? Are you kidding me? You're the warrior guy. Joab could have killed all them a long time ago. Why couldn't you just tell him to kill him? Why do I have to go kill him? <laughs> I'm sorry. Y'all. It, it gets me. It's fun. So then it gets to verse 10, 10 through 12. It says, then David died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. David had reigned over Israel for 40 years. Seven of them had been in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. Solomon became king and sat on the throne of David, his father. My favorite part. And his kingdom was firmly Establish. His kingdom was firmly established. Now you need to understand his kingdom was not easily firmly established. Just like it wasn't easy for me to get to this place where I'm at right now. He had to go through some junk, y'all. My background is horrible. I know people talk about mom and dad and what they did. It's horrible. My brother is trying to take my spot. All these things come into play way before his kingdom was ever firmly established. And here's what I want you to know in number three. Number three, blessings come when we fulfill the role that God has for us. Amen. Boy, I am living in that right now. Come blessings come when we fulfill the role that God has for us. Now, Solomon had just been crowned king. If Solomon was anything like me, then probably there was a temptation to go, you know, do I really want to go do dad's kill list? He's dead. He's not going to know. Like, do, do I really want, I want to establish myself. 
Like, I want to do things my way. I don't want to lead the church the same way he did. I want to do, I want to do things my way. I, want, I got this way that I feel like I'm supposed to go and I want to do things this way. And that's not what he did. He was faithful to do what he was supposed to do. And he goes out and he does exactly what his father tells him. The whole first part of his life, he kept the decrees. He did all of the things. He killed the people and showed mercy to the other people. And at the end of that, it says that he was firmly established. He did the role that God called him to do. And God blessed him with where God blessed him to be. I want to share with you my, my favorite piece of all of Solomon's writings. I'm sure several of you know this verse of scripture, but Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses one through four, it says, for everything there is a season. People that have been through all the seasons, they understand that. For everything there is a season. There's a time for every activity under the sun, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance. I love that. Why? Because we have to understand that there is a time for everything in our lives. There are seasons for everything in our lives. And when we're faithful in those seasons, we get to experience the other seasons. We get the blessings that come with fulfilling what God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. Church, can I be a little bit bold this morning? I think that so many people are stuck in a rut in life of doing nothing. It's a bold statement. They're miserable. They have bad attitudes. They hate life. I hear that all the time. I hate my life. Why? Here's why. Because we're too busy whining and being angry with where we're at instead of being faithful in where we're at. Amen. Y'all, that's pretty deep. So what do we do? We are faithful in where we're at. And every single time that we're faithful to God in where we're at, he gives us the blessings. Amen. Look at this, Matthew 25 and verse 21. I love this story. The master tells the servant, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling a small amount. Now I'm giving you more responsibilities. Here's what we need to understand. When we are faithful in the role that God has called us to play, he blesses us. Sometimes he moves us into other roles. Sometimes he makes us king. Sometimes, but here's what we know. When we're faithful in the responsibilities that he's given us, then he moves us up and blesses us. Somebody say amen. See, we, we love to hear about Solomon and the mighty Solomon and the rich Solomon and the blessed Solomon and full of wisdom Solomon. But it didn't start there. He had to go through a whole lot of his life before he ever got there. And here's what I want you to understand. God has given everyone in here a role. Some of you have a role as a mother, a role as a father, role as an employee, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a servant, a worker, a friend, a leader, an encourager, a worker, a boss. How about the role of a believer? I don't think that that role is very clear with most people anymore. What does it look like for me to walk in the role of a believer in Jesus Christ? Are you accepting the role and being faithful in the role that God has you in right now? Or are you just kind of whining about it, wishing that he would do something else? Wow. Would you stand this morning? I want to ask our, our worship band to step out and come to the front.
And while they're coming, would, would our altar team, would you guys step out and come right now? Listen, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Here's what we need to understand. Whatever role that you are in right now and you are playing right now, first of all, I want you to understand that it doesn't matter what your background is. God has a role for you to play. Maybe that role is the role of a mother and you've never, you've never served God, you've never worshiped God, you've never given him your all, you've never been baptized, but you know that you have the role of a mother or a father and this morning what you need to do is accept that role to move that role in the right way and be faithful in that role. And it doesn't matter what you've done, that is your role. And God's given you that role. The second thing that you need to know is it's not God's will for you to live in doubt of that role. He wants you to flourish and he wants you to move forward. And then lastly, when we're faithful in the role that he's given us, God blesses us. So here's what I want to do with every head bowed and every head closed. I just want to allow you to be challenged by the Holy Spirit this morning. And I want to ask us to turn this place into a house of prayer. I love the word says, my, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Here's what I want to do. If you're in here this morning and you know that you need prayer, maybe it didn't have to do with the message that I preached. Maybe it had to do with what Evan spoke over the expectation of what God was going to do today. You need prayer. Don't leave out of this room without getting the prayer that you need today. If you're here and you need prayer in just a second, when we begin to sing this song, then you step out and come get the prayer that you need. If you're here and you're looking for the Lord and you've had doubts, then it's time for you to jump up and accept today is the day of salvation. I want to encourage you to come and allow him to move in your life and discover who he is. If you're here and you need to be faithful in the role that he's given you and accept the role that he's given you and you want prayer for wisdom and guidance in the role that he's given you or maybe you're here and you're looking for that role. Listen, if you are here and you want prayer, whatever that looks like, in just a second, when we start singing this song, I want to invite you to come. Or if you're here and you say, Pastor, I don't really want somebody to pray for me, but I just want to get in the presence of God and spend some time with him and allow him to do what he wants to do in me. The altar area is open. The stairs up here are open. Let's find a place and just go to the Lord. Come on, let's sing this song together. Come on, right now. If you're here and you want prayer, step out and come right now.